my humble pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Bhagavan. Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Jay Sairam. Welcome to part six in this series of Sai Karana Talks, where we have been very fortunate so far to hear from two wonderful speakers recounting their experiences with Swami. Today we have another such speaker, Brother Dr. Sundaraya. Dr. Sundar is an alumnus of the Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning. He was in the first batch of students to join Swami's college in Puttaparthi in 1979. He completed his graduation, post-graduation, and subsequently earned his PhD in banking and finance. He then continued to teach at Swami's university until 1994. As with all students of his time, Brother Sunda had innumerable occasions of being close to Swami and learning from his direct divine presence. He has the privilege of being Swami's personal attendant for a short period during his student days. During these months of close encounters, Brother Sunda not only witnessed Swami in his day-to-day -day life, but was also privileged to be personally guided by the avatar. Later, in 1992, Swami was gracious to perform his wedding in Prashantamili. Brother Sunda's passion is practicing and teaching yoga, and he was the only student that received the gold medal for yoga during from the Divine Hands during the 1984 convocation of the Sai University. Everything he learned about the wonderful science he learned from Swami's lotus feet and from the masters who would visit the ashram. His passion for spreading the message of Sai through yoga and meditation has taken him around the world conducting yoga and meditation camps. Brother Sunda took early retirement from his IT career. He has now dedicated his life to spreading the message of traditional yoga through the principles of Sanatana Dharma. This is his life's mission. In 2013, Brother Sunda was ordained as an ecumenical minister by the Ecumenical Ministry of the Unity of All Religions in California. Brother Sunda had, has currently set up an international center for yoga, Vedanta and human advancement in his home. Having watched several of his talks online and heard him in person during a per previous visit to the UK, we are all in store for a treat today. So can I call, now call upon Brother Sunda to address us? Jay Sairam. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for that very kind and loving introduction. As you were speaking, um, right from the time I joined Swami's college, it was like a, my entire life just played out before my uh, mind's eye, if you will. And the heart is full of gratitude to what, what the Divine Master shared with me and it is with that great sense of humility a heartfelt gratitude an immense pleasure and privilege that I'm here to share some of my thoughts and my perspectives with you all as always before I begin I offer my deepest and most grateful pronouns at the divine feet of our beloved Sadhguru Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba. It has been a while since I was in UK. My one and only visit, visit uh, I think it was 2012, so I'm, I'm so happy to be back. And thank you all for inviting me into your homes. Sai Baba is a phenomenon. If you want me to say he is the God Almighty, I would hesitate to say that only because I have not understood that what that God Almighty is. But if I were to believe in a God who had that immense who represented all this God Almighty represented, and that would be Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba. I have known no other God other than Him in my life. So He is my God. He is my Satguru, the teacher who showed me the path. 
the truth awakened me and continues to do that awakening continues to guide me holding my hand such an enigma such a personality such a a, a, a mystery that had blessed this earth and lived in this earth during our times is something very historical for mankind very historical and while i say this is my my swami and my god and my sadguru that i'm sharing each one of you feel in that very same manner that he belongs to you and he's your personal god your personal guru that you can talk to in the privacy of your inner space in your inner meditations <clears throat> that is what makes this master so powerful so benign so beautiful so divine most of my stories are going to be the same i've run out of stories unless they are very 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 personal so bear with me if you have heard some of these experiences some incidents but the way i look at it is every time i'm invited to speak about swami whether it's online nowadays or at a retreat i only take it as what is swami going to teach me now in the course of this presentation in the course of this offering as i would like to call it because as much as you take home something from a talk such as this one i take home as much because whenever we revisit our own life experiences and experiences especially with the divine there is always something to learn from from a, from an individual point of view from a, a group like such as a family um, a community a nation there are universal teachings there are individual teachings there are teachings at every level and again that points to how universal swami was in his approach in his teachings and the way he taught us there were some very powerful lessons that has stayed with me and that will stay with me for many lifetimes because that has helped me in the actual evolution if you will of this jiva passing through this name and form of sundar and having had this privilege of being in the close proximity in the divine proximity of a teacher that inspired millions in one lifetime you know when i was um, in my teens it seems quite a long back <laughs> many many years ago in the 60s early 70s i was completely fed up with religion because i was raised in a very very traditional household i was like no i'm done with this i'm done with pujas and all of that and today i've come around a complete circle i chant mantras i do pujas i do rituals i do um, intense spiritual practices it's come a long way but in that circle of coming back to watch I, what i at one point though it was a very short period um i rebelled against i'm thinking what a learning that was what a divine learning that was and how i've come back home literally if you will with so much enlightenment with so much of learning from this divine teacher who taught us the immense meanings the deepest significances of rituals of chants of bhajans the symbolism behind gods and goddesses in the sanatan dharma that makes it so universal and so applicable to almost every individual that walks on this earth in fact i would say every creature that walks on this earth <clears throat> i still remember when i passed my 12th standard and my father was transferred to a remote village and they said oh, well, now we have to look for a college for you um there weren't too many residential institutions those days they were either um meant for very wealthy people because there were very few of them 
or for the extremely intelligent, like the Swami Vivekananda College uh, Residential School or College in uh, in uh, Chennai, I believe. And so, um, I, I I neither qualified for both of them. And then you get to hear that Sai Baba is opening a college in Puttaparthi. And my whole family reacted, no, 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 we don't want to go put him into that Sai Baba thing and all we don't because they were all very orthodox um, South Indian approach to the only gods are Shiva and Parvati and there can no be, no human beings can be gods and things like that. So from that we started and the journey to Swami has taken a whole big circle and then my parents came, they stayed. My father served in the Central Trust for many years until he passed away. So it is amazing how, when and how this divine opens that door. Sometimes it's, it's, um, it seems coincidental, but when you look back in your life, you see everything has had, was divinely orchestrated. It was, it was for a purpose. And we continue, as we continue to discover that purpose, we begin to understand the purpose of our lives and we begin to fulfill the purpose of our lives. And in that fulfillment lies the ultimate satisfaction of who we are, why we are born here on this planet. What is, what is the purpose of our lives? What is the mission of our lives? To me, that is what I take home from Swami. The one who stayed so focused in his mission, who was so divine simply by being human. So in the course of my talk today and, and, um, and next week, thank you again for allowing me to share this, uh, continue this next week. I would like to present the human side of Swami because in that humanity that he represented, in the human, human personality that he depicted to us, that, that I saw him live every day in and out where there were no hundreds of devotees watching him. There were just a few students. There were sometimes just me. Um, sometimes just a handful of people around him. What was he like? Who was he like? To me, those were the signs that proved to me even today in the depths of my heart that this was a divine phenomenon, not an ordinary human being like you and me, thinking what to do next, applying a logic considering management techniques of let's consider a project or, 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 or take into consideration the strengths, the opportunities, the weaknesses, the threats, and then let's take some management decisions, let's delegate work to people, let's organize this in a beautiful way, let's be structured and all of that. <clears throat> Pardon me one second. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So he broke all those principles. Not that we should break them. I'm just telling you exactly how it was. What are the lessons that I take home? And what are the lessons that we might perhaps have to look, look and consider? Because I think we are being raised in, in a particular fashion. And then we raise our children in that particular fashion. Our, our couple of generations, three, four generations ahead of us were raised in that fashion. And so we are just getting more and more streamlined into one way of learning things, one way of looking at certain things, one way of studying life, uh, one way of looking at reality. And anything else seems so foreign to us that we just put it away as heresy or disbelief or some crazy stuff. But then when you live with masters such as these, such as Swami, Then you suddenly are, you, 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 as they say, it blows your mind because it, it blows open so many different perspectives to look at life in, in a way you would have never thought to look at. He may not have preached this in, in exact words to us. He did in many ways. But his actions spoke louder than his words to me. And to me, that is what makes him divine in my heart. 
that is why I have have his picture his picture his only picture up in an altar because to me that is very significant when I look up to somebody that person has to be 100 percent a role model to me in every way possible. That's how I was in my childhood. That's what I was searching for in my teens. That's why I became a rebel in religions because I wanted to see that role model. I wasn't seeing it. I saw preachers. I saw pundits. I saw scholars. I heard them. But I wasn't able to see a role model that clicked with me. And he became that. Not overnight. It wasn't love at first sight. But it was a slow and steady discovery of this divine master. And I hope to share some of that, some of those thoughts, some of those discoveries, because I think this is not just my story or the story of Sai Baba. Um, I think when, when we are in these kind of forums where you have taken time, precious time of yours to actually sit in front of your phone or your computer or your TV and, and to listen to this, ready to open your heart to explore a higher dimension, then it is a learning for all of us. So there is something for each of us to take home and we revisit an, an individual story. And in this case, this individual is me because I like to share my first-hand experiences rather than somebody else's experiences, which you can anyway read and make up your own conclusions. So I try my best to limit my talks and and sharing of perspective based on what i have learned what i shared what i believe in my heart that is how i think spirituality has to be and in the early days when i would swami would pick me up to speak i remember distinctly this one time when he was in mumbai now it's called mumbai those days it was called bombay um he as he walked down for for his darshan and there are like i don't know 60 70 80 thousand people in front and uh, he had taken a group of us because we were doing this play and as he walked down towards as he was walking down he looked at me indicated to me to follow him and i did it i went behind him not knowing why is he asking me to follow him when there are other volunteers because i just presumed he is going down and he'd want me to pick up the envelopes which he usually hands over to a seva the volunteer but no, he went backstage and I followed him. And just as he was about to open the curtain, he looked back, he says, get ready to speak. And um, <laughs> that's how it was. And then he walked out and he gave the action from the stage and he sat down on the throne and I followed him, sat, on a, sat at his feet. And then when time came to speak, my mind was completely blank. But as I touched his feet, I looked up to him. He, of course, knew I was completely, I mean, nervous. Um, he, he could perhaps see the butterflies in my stomach. I don't know. I was nervous more so because you had, by then, you know, Swami was next to you. That was my main concern. I should not say something untoward. That would upset him because I've been there, done that, and I don't want, I didn't want that. And he looked at me and he said, why fear? Speak, speak from your heart. Speak about your faith. There is no, no need to fear. And uh, this, I, I believe, was in 87, 86, 1986 or 87. And I never looked back since. Never, ever looked back since. And so what I share is from my heart. I, I try, try not, to, not to prepare too much. I have a general idea. But then I always mentally do that same time. I kiss his feet mentally and i hear his voice say speak from your heart and when i open my heart i let the divine guide my thoughts my words so the humanity of swami when i say humanity of swami it's that that human part the 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 the, the way he lived his his day-to-day -day life as he was engaged in this mission of spreading satya, truth, dharma, righteousness, shanti, peace, prema, love, ahimsa, nonviolence. He wasn't 
I didn't see him build and design and sit around a round table and design projects and see how do we do this? Where is the money coming from? What is the source of funds and all of that? There wasn't any scientific approach, if you will, to this. And yet each and everything that he did succeeded. So that is what I want to explore because that's a very, very powerful lesson for all of us, no matter your age uh, at this point. I know we are, we are spanning a, a lot. Um, it's a big span of age from um, perhaps teenagers to young adults to adults in this group, I think. And so I think there is lessons for all of, for all of us in this. And I want to present this in the perspective of an individual who was born in a village. A village that was God forsaken, literally. In a God forsaken place, if you will. Quote unquote. Of course, God didn't forsake it. He actually took birth there. But nevertheless, Puttaparthi, even the name is, uh, was scary and it's still scary because if you know the meaning, it says a place of ant hills, snakes and scorpions, occasional floods, absolutely no water, drought prone area, somewhere in Andhra Pradesh. A village that was not even in the map of India. This was about 90 years ago, 95 years ago. And in the course of 90 years, look where it is now. You only have to type P U T T and then Puttaparthi comes up on Google. It has become a major spiritual center for those seeking deep spirituality. There is an airport there. There is a railway station there. There are highways, national highways going right into the ashram. How does all this happen? What are the strings Baba pulled? Where did he get the funds from to make this happen? The reason why I want to share this kind of perspective, and pardon me for not being traditional in my approach, because for me, it is, I need, I need things to be street smart. I need things that I can take home, that I can apply, that I can share. And I know there are youngsters watching this. And what happens is when we want to set out to do something big in life, whatever that is, become something or do something valuable, leave a legacy behind. We often look back and, and we, we often sit back and say, okay, I, I, you know, I really wish I had this. I wish I had this, I wish I had this. And we have a list of what we wish we had in order to have been successful or in order to be successful. Whatever that success means to you at this point. Whether it is a small little iPad or, or, or a computer or, or a broadband internet connection or a 4G or a 5G nowadays, a 5G phone or whatever it is that you want, you have to say, I wish I had that, then I could have really done this. Or I wish I had these, these X number of, number of followers for me, for me to take my message out. I needed more social networking and I need all of this. The things that you and I today think of and we consider it logical, practical, um, in order to step out there, right? But there is someone here, someone who set an example with his life where you didn't need any of this. And that is where I'm coming from. True, it was at the time when there was no internet connections and there were no computers and all of that. But there were other things that people at that point thought is required and important to be successful, to be known. But look at this young child being raised in this village, Puttaparthi, not known to the world at all. This was in 1920s, late 20s, 30s. And he, was, he spent his teenage and 40s where he discovered 1940, where he, where he was 14 years and he, and he declared his mission. This was a young teenager being raised in a village, decides to have this grand vision, not of spreading, uh, he, in, in, his, in his declaration there, he's not talking of how many people he's going to touch upon, the numbers didn't make sense, Numbers were never mentioned in his declaration and his vision. It was what he wanted to do. That was the vision. Not how successful he would be. 
If you read those letters he wrote earlier, if you, re if you read, it was always when he declared, especially when he says, I've come to light the lamp of love in your hearts, he's talking about what he wants to do. I've come to spread the four values of Satya, Dharma, Shanti, and Prema. This was a young boy with his dream of what he wants to do in his life. And look what he did in the next, in the span of the next 60 years or so of his life, assuming he started at 14 or 15. It's amazing. How many languages did he know that he attracted people from all over the world speaking all languages? He only knew one language, Telugu. He did speak English, he did speak Tamil, he did speak Kannada, he did speak Telugu, uh, I mean Tamil and so on. But his main language at that point when he steps out, this little boy just knew Telugu. We were at, we were with Swami at one uh, devotee's home for lunch. And Swami very kindly told this lady, tell these young boys some of your old times with Swami. It was like, let's go back to that old times chat because that lady had bought an album with, uh, of her and Swami and the old times of Swami. And in fact, Swami even said, give me these pictures. And she said, no, no, I'm not going to give it to you. These are my treasure. Um, and, and, the, and, and she spoke about a lot of things, but there's some, one thing I took home. I was like, wow, I want, to, I want to remember that. And this is what she said among the other things that she also shared. She said, Swami was a young boy when he would come to our house. And, um, and when I listened to uh, speakers like um, Mrs. Gita Ram and all that, these, these kind of thoughts do come because she shares some of those really old times with Swami. And you already heard her. She's an amazing, amazing speaker. And she has so much to share, so much to learn from her. Always a pleasure to listen to her. So this lady said <clears throat> that when Swami was young, he would come to our home. And um, he would have the, all these grand visions about doing this and doing that. And we would tell him, because she was in Chennai, that time it was called Madras. <clears throat> she was in Chennai. So she said, we would tell him, uh, you know, uh, Satya, it's good for you to speak about all this. But why don't you then stay here? We would, we would pull some strings and get you a place that you can start your mission from. Get you a place where you can start your ashram from. Why do you go to this, this, this place in Puttaparthi, even we can't come. How much, you know, how much planning we need to do? We, and finally, we have to take a bullock cart and, and travel those um, um, 15, 20 kilometers, whatever it is from the nearest railway station on a bullock cart. It's, it's not easy for us to do that. And so why don't you come here and start your mission here? And Baba was adamant, I believe. She said, as a young boy, he was adamant in saying, no, I have to go back. That is the place I want to start. I need to start there. If people have to come to me, they will come. To me, that's a very powerful lesson where an individual doesn't compromise in what he truly believes in his heart. That is important. What is our core belief that is driving us? What is your core belief that is driving you on everyday basis? And are you compromising on that belief just to please somebody or to attract somebody? That is, that is where we begin to compromise on who we are as individuals. And to me, that is like a fundamental lesson I take home from Swami. How he didn't compromise on his core belief. No, this is how it is going to be because this is what I believe. This is the place. This is my this is the place my mother wished I started. This is the place I got her blessing. This is my village. This is where I want to be. This to me is a very powerful lesson. So this is one thing I take home. I, I listen to it every day in my mind. And I want to share that with you because as youngsters, if, if you're stepping out and you're thinking what you want to do, first ask yourself, what is my core belief system? That is inspiring me to do this. Is it fear that is prompting me? If so, then let me step back and do this homework. The more we go within, the more we understand who we are and what is driving us, the more we will be able to reach out. This is the lesson from Swami. And that is the lesson of the Bhagavad Gita. The whole idea of a warrior and Arjuna, he pulls the, 
the bow, the string back. The idea is the more you pull the string back, the more the arrow is going to go out there, correct? But if you want the arrow to go way out, you want an arrow to go faster and towards the target and reach as far as possible, why are you first taking it back? Why are you stepping back? But that's the whole concept of spirituality. Even if you want to throw a ball um, that you want to take it for, further out there, the first thing you do with it, you take it back and then you fling it. And going back actually gives you that momentum. So going within and exploring that inner space from where everything is going to uh, blossom, if you will, or flower out, is so crucial. And to me, I dare say, I, I, I got that glimpse once in a while of that core energy principle that was in Swami's heart, the way he revealed it to me. And I saw there a burning intensity of pure divinity, pure divine energy that knew, that knew no fear, that knew no greed, that knew no boundaries, that knew no conditions. It was unconditional. It was un, unfringed, if you will. It was unbounded. It was purely divine in nature, that core energy that was driving Swami in what he was doing on an everyday basis, whether it was the smallest menial task in his room or it was a divine discourse that he would give to thousands of people or step out and meet the leaders of the world, be it educational, be it science, be it medical, he meant all, right? But the way I, I looked at that was, my gosh, where is that? How is this individual not having any fear? How is this person not having any anything that stops him? And that 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 appears logical to me to say, wait a minute, let's hold back the reins and think what to do next. So that was the core. The core is so important for us. And we forget to go within into the core because this is what I said earlier when I said we are raised in an educational system. We are raised in a system and we pass that system to, to our children, grandchildren, and somebody has passed it to us. And we are becoming more and more close to what the idea of reality is. And in that system of learning, we are not taught to go within. It was at one point, there were gurukulams, which is why I named my, uh, our, when I say I and my, it just includes Maya unconsciously or subconsciously as well. She's very much part of who I am and I'm part of who she is. And by the way, Maya is my wife, not the Maya, the illusion Maya. So don't get confused there. Um, the reason I share this is because in that, in, in those days in the Gurukulam, that was taught to young children. First realize who you are. First go within and find out what is driving you. Explore those core principles, those core values. Explore them and keep re-exploring them, redefining them, because that is a dynamic state. It's not like a once and for all thing. You're born with this or you're raised in a particular thing and therefore these become your core values. It, it, you, you have a chance to go within and keep redefining it. Keep exploring what is driving me and how can I go back and change that so it is, it's a two-way communication. Out external uh, circumstances, external learning begin to reinforce those core values. The core values in turn begin to manifest as relations, as, as jobs, as situations around you. So in a sense, we create our own reality based on what are the core values that guides our thoughts, our words, and eventually our actions. And all of this begin to create a reality around us, right? So there was a system of education that taught us to go within. So we don't have that now. We consider that it's boxed into something called religion or psychology or something like that, right? Oh, nothing is wrong with me. Why do I have to meditate? Somebody asks. So it's become like that. It's good or bad, I don't know, but that's how it is generally, correct? There are exceptions to this rule, but in general, in our, in our system of upbringing, in our system of learning, in our system of advancing into the world, nobody first says go examine your inner self, and then step out. 
even for our body, if to prepare yourself, you go into your wardrobe first, in the privacy of your wardrobe, and you begin to choose what you need to, and then check yourself in the mirror, and then step out to people, correct? So even in a physical sense, we have that sense of going within. So in our spiritual aspect, in our mental aspect, in our mission, if you will, in life, if we want to step out, we need to go so much more inside and keep searching and understanding. And when that clarity presents itself, then there is no stopping you, no stopping you. It comes naturally. So this is what I saw in Swami. It, it was natural for him. I didn't, I, the way I would, I would have thought earlier when I first discovered Swami, because like I said, I, I, I joined Baba's college because it was free education. I didn't perhaps mention that, but then as my parents were looking for this college, we came and they first said no to Sai Baba's college earlier. And then they said, yes, why? What changed? Simply because it was free education. As simple as that. Oh, it's free. Okay. Then in that case, yeah, let's that I go and try it. My father said. And so I said, okay. The point here is that energy that I saw in Swami was, was, was amazing. That was what was driving him. So when I was discovering him on a day-to-day -day basis, and it took a while. It didn't happen overnight, like I said. There was first curiosity. Curiosity as to how is he doing it? Is he think, sitting back and thinking about how to, how to start institutions? How does that come? How does the mission unfold? How do these visions come? And what is happening? And, and these were these are the simple questions that I was asking. Even at that time when he was uh, at any given day, there was five, ten thousand 10,000 people around him which only kept growing and growing and growing till the very last days of his life. I assumed that there was a lot of money in the bank, which is what was making him do this. Later on, I came to realize that that was not so. So it was curiosity first. And that curiosity is what, it took me one and a half years. One thing led to the other. And then in that interview, my first very close encounter with Swami, when he asked me, what do you want? I said, I want to be in your room because that is that was truly my inner desire. It didn't actually happen that way in the sense that I said first, no, 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 because I was so nervous that you were so close to me and asking me, what do you want? What do you want? Come on, bye. And I was like, no, no, I don't want anything. I don't want anything. I was just so nervous. But then as he kept pushing, suddenly it just came out of my mouth. I saw me, I want to be in your room. Because that was my desire. My desire was not not out of an ostentatious kind of a desire. Oh, let me see. Let me check him out. Kind of thing. No. By then I had grown because it was one and a half years of being there. I'd grown to respect him tremendously. I'd grown to like him tremendously. I'd grown to love him. But then there was that, that, that part which I didn't understand. And I wanted that to open so that I can once and for all um, accept him as my teacher, my guru. And it was so simple. He said, oh, okay, you can come from tomorrow. It was so simple, as simple as that. And I always pause here to share that lesson, which I always um, share in that lesson here is, if, if an opportunity presents, ask for the very best. And to me, that opportunity presented, and I'm so glad that Swami pushed me to a point where I didn't have to think because he was given a chance to think. I would have said, who am I to ask being in his room? I'm not even a devotee. And I, I, Swami doesn't know me. Who am I to ask? And all of that would have come for me, I, you know, all of that. But he didn't give me a chance. He just pushed out that innermost desire to pop up and boom, it manifested right there. So there, there was a lesson when I asked and I got it. And there was a lesson later and many years later when I asked and he didn't give me because he was ready to teach me the higher lessons. And hopefully we will touch upon that if we have a chance between the session and the next. But here is that, that, that beauty there was that curiosity turning into admiration, that admiration turning into devotion, devotion giving way to love, true love, like love from the heart, like one-on-one -on -one love, right? The earlier love and respect always general. And that love turning to a sense of deep surrender that I need to look no further. This is it. This is my teacher. This is my role model. And once that happened in the course of five, six years of my stay there, then everything just leaped in such that when I say everything, it's I'm talking about the spiritual progress. It just took leaps and bounds. It just, my whole consciousness exploded into truly understanding 
the inner reality of the self and so on. So that core values is to me a very important matter. And bear, bear with me if I'm, if I'm pausing there at this particular concept because it is so, so very important. And in that core space, your innermost space is where your faith inside, your faith in yourself, and all of that is defined. And so my inner space cannot be my wife, Maya's inner space, or cannot be my child. I don't have a child, but I'm just giving an analogy. My child's inner space. I cannot force my belief and my core values into them and say, oh, you also do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, learn it. That is what is happening in this modern system of education. We don't want to do that. That is when it becomes an institution, a religion, a dogma, a doctrine. And Swami is not of that. Is Swami teachings uh, confined to Hinduism? No, he's using stories and analogies from the Hindu scriptures because they are some of the oldest religions. Oldest, when I say religion, again, let me take that back. The oldest way of life, if you will. Sanatana Dharma is not even a religion. It was a way of life. We have call, we begin to call things religion and boxing it into different patterns. There was a time this world didn't have those kind of boundaries. The world was not, as Tagore would say, <clears throat> not broken up into fragments of narrow domestic walls. It wasn't at one point. But it is now. It is fragmented. It is broken. And that is a reflection of what's happening inside us. We have broken our own consciousness. And therefore, when I go within and I find that a part of me is in that tree, a part of me is in the river, a part of me is in the air around me, and I am part of this universe, the universe is a part of me, and I see that interconnection. In that interconnectedness, my consciousness begins to expand. I begin to embrace everyone and everything, and slowly the, the broken fragments once again heal. So bear with me then that core space, that inner space that I talk about. It's so important because that, that is what drives us as individuals. And it is very important for us in our meditations to go to that inner space. And that inner space, that inner altar, if you will, within the cave of our heart is, where, is what drives you in your decisions of every day. It is what drives you and creates the reality around you. So if you and I don't like what is happening around me at this point, don't try to fix outside, go within and ask, what is it? Swami worked from that core principle that he was divine. Swami would often say this, you have heard this, Baba's quote, when I am among women, I am Women, I am a woman. When I'm among men, I'm a man. Among children, I'm a child. Alone, I am God. I saw him alone in his room. Alone. There were times he would not speak to anyone. Oftentimes, he would just sit in his chair, one and only chair in that tiny room. You and I are complaining. If we are complaining about lockdown, we need to think about somebody who brought it upon himself for a long, long, long time. He would only step out to give darshans. Never, there was no such thing as a private space for him to walk and just be himself and take a breath of fresh air. So he would often find himself in that small little room, maybe around 12 feet by 12 feet, I would think. Um, stone walls around one little window. Uh, a couple of incandescent bulbs. Incandescent is what they call it. Okay, incandescent. I'm always confused with that. Um, anyway, um, a ceiling fan, one single chair, um, a pile of letters next to him. That's all it was. And in that, he sits and goes deep into himself. So as a youngster, I used to think, where does he get his energy from? What is the source? That is prompting him to do what he is doing. He steps out and he is counseling people. He, he comes to the bhajans and listens to all the, excuse me, <coughs> songs. He's always out there for everyone else, right? He's always out there for everyone. Where is the time he has for himself? So even alone when he's sitting, he's reading letters. There are very occasional moments he would close his eyes and go deep into some, some state which can... For the lack of any other word, don't quote me, lack of any other word, I would say trance, but then 
that's perhaps not the, the word to describe. You just go somewhere deep inside. That's when watching this on an everyday basis, I begin to understand, and I'm now completely convinced that he was able to tap a source from within himself. A source that was unending and is unending in its capacity to give, to bless, to heal. So if we need to tap that source, it is not in the long walks out in nature. We could seek inspiration from that. We need all these kind of props for us, you and me. But once we begin to tap that source inside, then you could be in the stillness of a cave deep in the Himalayas. You could be in the aloneness of your room, in your house, in your home. And yet you will be in complete communion with the universe. I know some of your experiences, if not all. I know that. And, and it, these, are, these are things are not mystical and so far out. Like, oh, I don't know when that's going to happen to me. We all have experienced that in fleeting moments where suddenly the heart opens and you don't care about where you are. The heart opens and you're in bliss. Whether it is a bhajan that took you there, whether it was a story that took you there, whether it was a movie for that took you there, whether it was a, a TV show that took you there, we don't know, a book, but it takes you there. Those, those, those doors open. Where the, because the, where are those doors? Inside us. So the door to that inner divinity is so close. In other words, Sai is so close to us that he is waiting for you to just open that door. And then he comes pouring forth with this divine wisdom, divine energy, divine source of health and wellness and abundance and all of that is given. And then slowly as we nurture that inner divinity more and more and more and more, then that begins to reflect through our thoughts, through our words, through our deeds. And then we look around and see only that being manifested in our lives. So in a sense, we create our own reality. This is what I saw Baba creating around himself. A reality that he totally believed that he has come to create. He was able to tap into that inner resource. And when Baba tells you and me, and this is again his quote, and I quote him, I am God, but you are God as well. In other words, I am divine. I know it. The only, the only difference. Let me finish that. So again, let me quote. I'm bad in this. So quote. I am God, you are God as well. I know it, you don't. Unquote. This is a core thing. And one Swami said, you choose not to know it. You choose, it's your choice. You just make up your mind and begin to believe. Then your definition of what God is begins to manifest. And so you need to go back and keep exploring and redefining what God is. And as you keep redefining, as you evolve in your definition, as you begin to explore and discover more, then that principle of God also begins to change and therefore you begin to manifest more and more and more. That is why I refrain from defining Sai Baba as God because I'm still exploring and exploring and redefining that concept. This is the beauty of that inner spirit. That Swami teaches us. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to, I want to end um, this, this talk, if you will, with a very beautiful uh, experience that I had. And I've shared this again in Soul Journal and other videos, but it's worth it. And somehow in this context of what I've been presenting, this has come to me. It's a very powerful lesson that, uh, that I saw one day in this in this evening with Baba being alone. So we are sitting at his feet, two of us. And for some reason that evening, Baba said, I don't want, he didn't encourage any visitors. When I say encourage visitors, it just meant that he's up in his room and there are ashram people, the, the, the administrators in the ashram, they had their fixed time. They would come and report to Swami, what is going on in the ashram, what to do, what not to do and so on. And so, that evening, and there were many such evenings, but that one particular evening, he didn't, he just did like this. Whoever would come at the door, he would just say, no, I don't want to see anyone. And all he did was sit and read one letter after the other. 
occasionally he would lean back rest his head on the on the back of his chair close his eyes for a few moments take a deep sigh heave a sigh and then come back open the letter another letter and this is gone from about seven o'clock in the night till about 8 45 8 50 it went on one and a half hours one hour 45 minutes so it was one of the surreal moments because the two of us are simply sitting and, and pressing his feet and here he is completely lost in his own world with his letters with there was no conversation at all and then as and then suddenly he glanced up there's a clock next to those incandescent bulbs <laughs> next to that there was this clock he looks up and he says oh it's time for him to go to bed he looks up and decides to get up and usually before he gets up he'd look at us and allow us to take namaskar we would touch his feet and then okay um i've been told i can continue but another 15 minutes so yeah thank you thank you um let me finish this thought therefore and so he would normally get up and offer allow us to take namaskar and all of that and um ask us something you know some small small questions like did you have your dinner what it is and all of that something he would say and go go into his room but that particular evening as he got up he was in his completely engrossed in himself he wasn't seeing us literally but he was murmuring something and so since we didn't get our namaskar because you know we are always about what am i going to get oh my gosh i'm missing what i'm getting i have to get my namaskar we were all about i and mine so i was definitely there about me i was like oh wait 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 i need my namaskar notwithstanding the fact that i was actually pressing his feet for the last uh, one and a half hours but <laughs> silly how we want only more and more and some, sometimes we get caught into that anyway um as he gets up from his chair and 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 his bedroom is what like 12 feet away so this is there's all this happens in that 12 feet of walking between that so he he well before he gets up he just he's sitting and staring and he looks at the clock oh and he, he decides it's time up time for him to bed so, uh, go to bed right so he puts the letters away and then he starts saying these words as he's getting up so he was sitting getting up and all of this was happening so as he was saying these are the words that were he was talking to himself okay not to us but i could make out what he was saying he says i've read so many letters and i'm paraphrasing them in english obviously he was talking in telugu in tamil the letter chadivano and all like like that so he was just talking to himself this is how he was he is very 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 uh, his his inner world i think was alive i think okay please i can't i can't even dare get there but it was so alive for him he was saying things which you and i can't see in in, in every sense of the term so he is uh, talking to himself he says i've read so many letters some people who don't have jobs want jobs then they have problems with jobs some others have problems with their jobs some people don't have children they want children some people have problems with their children so he just goes a couple of them like this everybody wants something koriklu koriklu is a word koriklu in telugu doesn't mean desires i think we wrongly translate that and we we we, we mess that up in our understanding of what desires are and i don't know we'll ever get a chance to visit that part but koriklu here with swami would say is actually translated rightly in my opinion is is craving there is craving okay if i want uh, a a a glass of um, warm milk it's a desire to drink milk the desire to drink milk is not bad but the craving the wanting is what makes you keeps this away rather than manifest in my life so think about that anyway so he said intamandi andarku korikulu 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 everybody has this craving this wanting this lack of something in life right so we are focused more on the want than the fulfillment of what it is anyway something for you to think about these are the words that came so i for me i pay attention to every word that came that comes out of sami's mouth and so this was one word that really caught my attention ever since andar ko korikulo 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 everybody is craving for something everybody wants something and then he, he then suddenly there was this human element that was so beautiful 
he said i have read so many letters i never got one that said thank you <clears throat> i never got one i simply said thank you and he gets up and he starts walking towards his bedroom <clears throat> so this was was this a, a weak moment in the avatar i don't know because we are very quickly saying oh he is god he does all this he waves his hand and makes things happen i didn't that that part of it i saw very little this is the part i saw this is the part that touches me most this is the part that wants my heart to believe he is divine and i allow that belief to happen because that's that's what it is in my innermost in a, in my innermost space i see this beauty there and so he says i read so much i didn't get a thank you and then he gets up and starts walking and then he's continuing to murmur now so we are kneeling and i'm thinking where is my namaskar so we are kneeling and on our knees we are crawling next to him as he's walking those 10 10 steps or so and he's looking down shaking his head and he's talking to himself he says i have come and my plane i have come in my plane my plane has landed and i'm standing on the edge of my plane and i'm calling people to come into my plane but you are all now he's saying you are all me randru talking to himself but you know as we talking to some people he says you are all sitting there doing projects and bhajans and aarti lu chestunaru bhajanal lu chestunaru project lu chestunaru um meaning but you are doing bhajans and aartis and projects and nobody comes into my plane and then just before he goes and he says and of course we were quick to touch his feet because he was not really really pausing to give us a namaskar and so he's as he's leaving he says nen elu tappudu when i when i leave i won't even have five people in my plane that's it so imagine evenings <laughs> or moments like these that are so vivid now we have to understand that when we say swami said no oh, five people in this plane so he passed away does it mean we should have also died along with him it's not that don't take it literally i don't i don't think we should take it literally the, the, the point here is what is he come to give us and why are we hesitating to get into his plane in other words he has come to give us the highest knowledge that you and i are divine he wants us to recognize that he taught us the essence and the core of all his discourses all his teachings if you want to come come to one thing one thing alone and that is i am god i am god <clears throat> i am not different from god this is what he wants you to say he experiences it all the time and he shares what can one do with that awareness so here's here's a question if a teenager asks me so what do i do if i if i realize i'm god i would say look at these role models look at the life of jesus what he did look at the life of sai baba what he does when you believe that you are god you touch lives of millions of people and you don't need social networks you don't need money you don't need anything all those resources come to serve you but i'll touch upon that more next week i guess depending on what swami wants me to speak that one week seems so far away so many things can happen in the meantime but the point here is he what today as of now at this moment open your hearts if you will and just consider the possibility that the divine being that you're searching for the god that you're praying to is you your higher self and if that opening happens even if it's a tiny bit light begins to come in because that is what this sai has come to give us that i believe is the essence the core of sai baba's teachings 1983 i think november 23rd on his discourse and there's a pdf file somewhere around very beautiful very short discourse 
But in the end, he says, I'm giving you this gift, this mantra. And we say this in our bhajans sometimes. For those of you who sing in English bhajans, I am God, I am God, I am not different from God. I am Sat Chit Ananda, Truth, Awareness, Bliss. I am Akhanda Parabrahman, Akhanda, Indivisible, Absolute, Supreme. That's the only way you can describe it. Akhanda Parabrahman. Grief and anxiety can never affect me. I am ever content. Fear cannot enter me. I am God. I am God. I am not different from God. If you are looking for empowerment, especially during these times, such as lockdowns and fear of viruses and fear of illnesses, then it is time for us to go back to the drawing board. Say, where, did, where did we miss? What did we miss? You know what we have missed in our lives? Spirituality. Spiritual values. Not religion, spirituality. And if we only can tap into that source, teach our children to tap into that source, in the path they choose, in the path you choose, and the path I choose, for me it has been yoga, and it's not just yoga as an exercise, but anyway, that's a whole different lecture. But the point is, whatever the path is, in your path, if you, if you use spirituality as a matter of convenience, then it may not manifest the way you want your life to manifest. But if your life revolves around spiritual values, your inner core values that are driving you, if your life revolves around that, and if you are able to make it spiritual, solid, strong, powerful, that, and that spirituality has this core belief, somehow you have to nurture it at some point that the divinity is from me. I am divine. And this whole consciousness, this expansion of consciousness, this earth and the sky and the heavens and all of these dimensions are all manifestations of my consciousness. And therefore, I will take all of this within me and I release it out in the universe. I am the one I pray to. That becomes the ultimate self-empowerment. So with these thoughts, I wish to bring this beautiful satsang. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts. Shank, thank you for um, allowing me to, to bring Sai back and those, those moments, uh, those moments of, um, they're so real, so alive in my heart even today. <clears throat> And these tears are not tears of sadness or something. It just emotion builds up. It's like a, a sense of bliss, a sense of a deep connection with the divine. And tears just flow. Um, I used to be, I used to be a little shy when this happens, but not anymore. I just, it perhaps age catches up on you and you say, you know what, I don't care anymore. That's what happens when you turn 60. I'm not yet turned, it's around the corner end of this year, but um, <laughs> I guess that's what happens when you get older, you get more emotional. Uh, but there is a joy in reliving those moments. You have made it possible. And so I'm, I'm always a little selfish then in that sense of sharing these, these, these precious, precious moments. And I hope you take home some message from what was shared today. I know I'm taking home this message that we really need to start opening up, going back to that source, that inner core, and keep examining, examining those values. Thank you for all your patience, and I hope to see you all next Sunday. I hope Swami makes it all possible again. And with my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you, to the Sai in you, I bring this satsang to an end. Thank you, Sairam. Sairam, thank you, Brother Sundar, for that wonderful and heartwarming and emotional uh, talk. Uh, we appreciated that so much. Thank you once again. There are several stories that will stay with me. For example, uh, when you were unexpectedly asked to uh, speak in front of thousands of people and Swami said to you, why fear? 
speak from the heart. Also, when you know, you're at a devotee's house with Swami and she was relating stories from the olden days and asked Swami to um, start his ashram in, in Chennai and Swami said, you know, uh, it, it will always be in, in, in Prashanti and people who want to come will come. Those, those are uh, stories with so much hidden meaning uh, for us to all um, uh, take home. One of the other clear messages from, from your talk today was for all of us to start looking within um, and to hear our individual message that Swami has for us. So that was um, so wonderful to hear, hear, hear you speak about all of those things. So once again, thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing from you again uh, next Sunday. Thank you. Jay Sairam.